Whoopi Tyra, Yo, Get Along Little Doggy, uh, Examining the Singing Cowboy in the American Mythology. Um, so uh, I'm going to be talking about the figure of the singing cowboy um, pertaining to this kind of creation of Americana. And so up here I have some things you might know a singing cowboy from that could just be knowing Gene Autry from driving up to Anaheim, or maybe you've seen a movie or just have heard talking about Gene Autry or Roy Rogers. Um, but I'm going to be talking about outliers from the common interpretation of the singing cowboy and try and get a little deeper into the meaning of what this, uh, what the historical ramifications are. So I'm going to be talking about um, this singing cowboy and actual cowboy, Harry Mac McClintock, who was actually a member of the IWW. And so the IWW, or the One Big Union, was an industrial workers labor union uh, that was considered quite radical, verging on anarchism. And uh, he was a songster who would perform uh, songs that IWW songster Joe Hill would write. And my second outlier is Herb Jeffries, who's the first black singing cowboy uh, on film. And so my thesis is that the American singing cowboy became a popular mythologized and constructed concept in the American consciousness. In examining outliers from the common interpretation, one is able to navigate an American vernacular rife with muscular nationalist symbolism, myth-making, and dog-whistle political language harkening back to ideologically simpler times. And so here I have a picture of Gene Autry donning a different sort of uniform, and he's very much demonstrating that kind of connection of the figure of the singing cowboy to this kind of muscular nationalist patriot. Um, so if we're going to be talking about singing cowboys, we need to talk about the cowboy folk songs, which would originate on the long cattle drives from Texas up to Dodge City and Kansas. Um, these were really brutal um, uh, tracks, and uh, also the cowboys who were on them were a lot more diverse than media tends to uh, give us the idea. Um, an estimate says that about 25% of all cowboys were African American and a substantial portion were uh, Mexican-American as well, um, contributing tons to cowboy culture with lassoing, and lots of uh, terminology comes from uh, Mexican uh, terms. Uh, so here I have a uh, singing cowboy who's not quite as sexy as Gina Hunchery, um, uh, and he has a face kind of made for radio. Uh, <laughs> These uh, songs actually focus more on profanity and cursing the wage labor that the cowboys had to perform. Uh, many of them throwing kind of shade at their bosses, and uh, they were venerations of deceased co-workers who had either um, died in stampedes or other uh, work-related accidents. So there's very much this idea of the cowboy being a wage laborer, being an exploited class. And so here, comparing Gene Autry to Edward L. Crane, the actual cowboy and cowboy singer. Um, so around the 1910s, folklorists like John A. Lomax, pictured here, uh, collected uh, cowboy labor poetry. Um, he started to pay a lot of attention to cowboy ballads as an important uh, artistic point in uh, American culture. And so by collecting all these, uh, Lomax actually uh, sets the stage for these songs to start being commercialized and start to be uh, constructed into something they no longer are. And so, oh, um, I say that Cowboydom's biggest fan at this point is Theodore Roosevelt, um, who uh, actually writes the introduction to John A. Lomax's uh, anthology of cowboy poetry, um, essentially attaching his ideology onto the figure of the cowboy. And for him, the mythos of the singing cowboy drained bourgeois notions of modern living for him. It uh, demonstrated an inherent white superiority as well as masculinity. Um, for him, it embodied his nas uh, muscular nationalist ideas, social Darwinism, and manifest destiny. And here I have a quote from him that is him pretty blatantly explaining how he feels about the figure of the cowboy pertaining to white supremacy. He says, Indians and whites often race against each other as well as among themselves. I have seen several such contests, and in every case but one, the white man happens to win. Some of the cowboys are Mexicans, 
who generally do the actual work well enough, but are not trustworthy. One spring I had with my wagon a Pueblo Indian, an excellent rider and rover, but a worthless lazy drunkard. And that's from his book, uh, Ranch Life and on the Hunting Trail. So as we can see, for him, he's very out in the open on how this uh, pertains to his muscular nationalist and kind of um, really uh, just nationalistic ideology. And so when talking, I have to define it, of course. Um, an ideology centering uh, values of martial prowess, physical strength, and battles against groups defined as enemies of the nation, values commonly expressed by the male body. And so here I have uh, an early singing cowboy of the screen who actually didn't do much of the singing, but um, Ken Maynard, who was constructed as just this um, uh, sex symbol of the 20s and uh, was always put in tighter and tighter clothing. Um, and he was uh, made to appeal to women in the 1920s who were recently able to engage in consumerist markets. Uh, opposing, I have this um, song, not quite a folk song, but arising in the 1910s and 20s, The Lavender Cowboy. Uh, it's actually about what we would probably today uh, know as a homosexual cowboy. And the idea in this song is that because this cowboy is gay, he can't perform his job to the capacity that a normal masculine cowboy could. And so the first actual singing cowboy is Carl T. Spray. Um, he first recorded in 1925 for Victor Talking Records. And he would um, draw from the material Lomax had provided, as well as just original folk songs. And he would enter cowboy balladry into the mainstream, allowing it to connect with uh, uh, engagers in mass media. And although uh, he would sing cowboy songs and grew up in a cow town, he was actually a college graduate and uh, never worked around the cattle. Um, so we are starting to see it distancing itself from the original folk roots. Um, now, because we're talking about country music and uh, early country music in particular, uh, we have to talk about the Bristol session considered country music's Big Bang, in which Ralph Peer, a Victor artisan repertoire man, um, decided to reach into unexploited rural markets to uh, kind of uh, tap in and get some of that unexploited rural money. Uh, he did this through hosting auditions in Bristol, Tennessee, which launched the career of Jimmy Rogers and the Carter family, uh, who around this time are the two biggest names in country music. And so Jimmy Rogers, who uh, came about from the Bristol se session, um, was a tubercular brakeman. Uh, he had tuberculosis and he was a railroad worker, and this actually forced him to have to consider singing as a career. Um, he had a trademark blue yodel, um, which is actually what we think of when we think of the yodeling cowboy. Um, this yodeling style of singing would become a cowboy staple, and so we hear this go on with Gene Autry, Roy Rogers, and the likes. And uh, although um, pictured here, he's wearing some cowboy regalia, he actually almost never recorded cowboy music at all. Uh, he recorded his own little blue yodely uh, kind of uh, rounder figure music. And so we have to ask if he's in Bristol or around Bristol, Tennessee, where is he picking up the yodel from? Because that is geographically nowhere near the Alps. Um, well, he actually got it from a very different place. He got it from Blackface Minstrelsy. Um, and he specifically got it from a minstrel named Emmett Miller, who would actually employ a yodel as a sort of demeaning line. Um, and it's a very um, a mixture of um, degrading clownish behavior, while at the same time an appropriation of blues culture. Um, so blackface minstrelsy is sadly the first distinctly American form of theatrical entertainment. Um, Caucasian performers would black up and just degrade um, African Americans through this somewhat ritualistic activity. Um, but also at the same time, it was the only way during the time that a white person could engage in playing um, traditionally African American music. So there is a very complex kind of cultural curiosity going on at the same time. And so here I have a picture of Gene Autry um, demonstrating that lineage between cowboy yodeling, cowboy music, and blackface minstrelsy, pictured here with an entire troupe of blackface minstrelsy. 
Um, I have attached a quote by Frederick Douglass speaking about how he feels about blackface minstrelsy. Uh, the filthy scum of white society, who have stolen from us a complexion denied to them by nature, in which to make money and pander to the corrupt taste of their white fellow citizens. And so now we're at our first outlier, Harry Mack McClintock, who, as I mentioned, was an IWW songster and an actual cowboy. Uh, so he has that, which many don't already. Uh, he's actually uh, said to be the first to sing Joe Hill, the IWW songster's uh, composition, The Long-Haired Preacher and the Slave, uh, although you might know him for singing The Big Rock Candy Mountain. Uh, but what he does is he restructures the narrative to focus on the cowboy as a wage laborer, as a person who's being exploited and um, who needs to uh, be recognized as a member of the proletariat. And so around this time, the singing cowboy is becoming more popular on the screen. Uh, he's demonstrating muscular nationalism all this time, and afford, uh, sound affords singing. Um, and this was able to integrate advertising into the film, with singles being tied into some, um, movies, uh, with Old Santa Fe coinciding with Ken Maynard and Gene Autry's song, In Old Santa Fe. So Gene Autry is passed the baton through his introduction in this film and is able to perpetrate this kind of muscular nationalist figure as well. And so I say that this screen around this time is actually allowing for a new type of blackface minstrelsy, a much more covert form of blackface. Uh, seeing with Smiley Burnett, Gene Autry's sidekick, who would engage in typical minstrel behavior, all the while doing it um, most often without blacking up, although he did occasionally do so in film. Um, so this is a very, um, it's diluting from its original form while still maintaining the original um, kind of uh, message. And so that brings us to my last outlier, Herbert Jeffries, uh, Hollywood's first black singing cowboy. And he amends the narrative that um, there was no diversity in the Old West. He would perform with, uh, in these films with an all black cast and they would never address the fact that everyone in this film was black, much like how Gene Autry would never, or the creators of those films, never address that the West is all white in their interpretation. And he would appear as Cowboy Bob Blake in four films. And so the significance behind this is that we need to understand construction and revisionist narratives surrounding alleged Americana. We have to view muscular nationalism's attachment to a nostalgic national character embodying preconceived notions of Americana, and we have to understand what it means when people employ cowboy imagery um, and see that there can be muscular nationalist and supremacist ideologies hearkening back to simpler times. Uh, so dog whistle, uh, thank you, I probably should have defined that, um, is uh, sort of a um, political um, type of verbiage in which you are uh, pointing towards something without actually saying it. So in the sense like tough on crime could potentially mean uh, slightly more, um, uh, if you can. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. Um. Also, like if you end up taking this like further to yeah. other conferences, which I highly recommend you do because you are fantastic at what you do. Um, if you have time, I don't know how the time was on this. Like if you can get some audio, because yes. you yes, kept saying like as as you know, and, like I mean it, it reminded yes. me. My grandfather was like way into this, but like I'm older than probably many of the other people who will be in your audience, and so like I don't know like how many people like are even aware yes. of like what some of this is because it is so rich and so awesome. Absolutely. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Just, um, I was trying to get some audio in, but that would put yeah, me on the yeah, show, sadly. Yeah. I'm sure it's all difficult to cram everything into yeah. 15 minutes. So excellent work. Keep it up. Thank you. Yes. Oh, um, I've been like reading on the internet that there's, there was a sort of like a thriving gay culture with the Catholic communities at the time. Um, I can't speak to 
particular research, but um, in reading about the singing cowboys of the screen, there's uh, quite a bit of um, attention, at least, uh, that uh, cowboys like Gene Autry and Ken Maynard pay attention to um, on their image. They're very conscious of, um, uh, for instance, uh, their sidekicks often will dress up in drag to draw attention away from any potentially uh, unmasculine behavior in the cowboys. So all throughout, including the Lavender Cowboy, there's attention paid to potential homosexual undertones. Um, however, I, I haven't seen any research about actual cowboys and statistics on that. Question? Maybe I missed it, but is this how the blackface trend started? Is this where it started? Well, um, it's how uh, blackface came to become really integrated into country music primarily. This, uh, as well as um, medicine shows, um, but minstrelsy was uh, just so deeply rooted in our American culture that it kind of seeps in in really unexpected ways. Um, uh, this, yes, so this is uh, the primary way that blackface has continued, although with country music, um, country music's just invariably tied to blackface. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. How likely was it for people, uh, you might say, the movie-going pu uh, public to actually see a Herbert Jeffrey film? Uh, sadly, uh, seeing a Herbert Jeffrey film would be very difficult, um, especially because they were shown uh, in Harlem in segregated theaters and very uh, limited release. Um, and they actually have extremely low budgets, lower than the already uh, deemed poverty row uh, Gene Autry films. So, uh, if you get a chance to see any Herb Jeffrey movies, you'll be uh, pretty uh, in, uh, regaled by how low the budget is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, similar to those 1970 black exploitation films? Uh, absolutely <laughs> similar to black exploitation. Um, the director for these films, uh, Richard C. Kahn, I believe, um, uh, was white, although uh, it was Herb Jeffrey's who um, came up with the idea to do a black singing cowboy movie. He was really frustrated with seeing no diversity in Gene Autry's films. And so he came up with this idea. And he actually was a singer in Duke Ellington's band and decided to leave to pursue this uh, vision he had. But of course, it was only able to uh, exist at that time under the director, a white director. And so it, in watching it, it does have similar uh, Themes to black uh, black exploitation. So you said the director was white. Yes. Is the production company also? Uh, do you know where the money's coming from for these films? I believe lots of the money came from Herb Jeffries and um, Spencer Williams, I believe, who was the brother of Clarence Williams, a famous jazz musician. Uh, so this was funded by the black community who wanted to put out like their own interpretation of Western media. You mentioned 25% of cowboys were black and Mexican. Did you find in your research any popular Mexican cowboys? Um, I actually, in my um, research, I did come across uh, several um, Mexican cowboys um, in Mexico. They would make singing cowboy movies, although um, I just am not very fluent in Spanish, so I wasn't able to get to most of that uh, research. Um, but if I extended this, I would really want to look into that further. Yeah, I feel like there would be a whole new thing, yes. Yes. <laughs> making it into like even the mariachi, and yeah, especially since music is part of your Awesome. Thank you. Well,